Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Nicolas Veron. It's uh, uh, my pleasure, and I have to say, an extraordinary, an extraordinary privilege today to host Valeria Gontareva, or Hontareva, as uh, her name is transcribed in Ukrainian, uh, who uh, used to be the governor of the Central National Bank of Ukraine, the country's central bank, and of course, uh, is. Uh, uh, it's difficult to think of somebody who could uh, be more insightful and qualified uh, to talk about our topic today, which is Ukraine's war economy in the current circumstances. Valeria Gontareva studied at the Kiev uh, Polytechnical Institute, uh, where she graduated in 1987. She started a career at the, as an engineer in the Ukrainian Center for Standardization and Metrology. She worked at the Heavy Machinery Design Institution in Kiev, and in 1993, of course, in a changed environment, she um, moved to the financial industry. She worked at ING, at Societe Generale in Kiev. Uh, in 2001, she was deputy chair of uh, ING in the country. In 2007, she became partner and chair of uh, an investment company called Investment Capital Ukraine. And in June 2014, uh, uh, on June 19, a few weeks after the Maidan uh, or revolution or revolution of dignity, as it's known in Ukraine, she became the governor of the National Bank. Uh, the first female governor of the National Bank of Ukraine and um, ha had a very intense term uh, where um, she uh, had major achievements in restructuring the National Bank, uh, downsizing it from 12,000 to 5,000 employees and completely restructuring the operations in uh, the monetary policy regime, floating the national currencies, the hryvnia and uh, establishing uh, an inflation targeting regime, and perhaps most notably in uh, completely restructuring the banking system. Uh, Governor Gontareva resolved or closed uh, 87 banks in Ukraine during her term, if I'm correct, representing about 60% of the system's total assets. And that included uh, what I think was the largest, uh, unless you correct me, uh, which was Privat Bank, uh, uh, the quintessential oligarchic bank, uh, which was nationalized and still is uh, in state hands, uh, despite many lawsuits. Um, and uh, maybe she will tell us about that if we have time. Anyway, uh, Governor Gontareva resigned on 10th of April 2017, uh, five years ago, uh, declaring my mission is complete. And since then, she's uh, lived in London, uh, joined the Institute of Global Affairs at the London School of Economics and Political Science in 2018. Uh, 18, where she's now a senior resident fellow. I have to say that for me, um, Governor Gontareva is really uh, the quintessential profiling courage. She has paid heavily for her reform efforts. Uh, that, of course, is dwarfed by what the country is experiencing right now. But I think uh, it's a great privilege for us at the Peterson Institute to host her today. Patrick Honhan uh, is well known to the um, viewers of the series, uh, not here for the first time. Uh, he studied at University College Dublin in the 70s and then at the London School of Economics as well. Uh, in 1971, he joined the IMF and worked at the Central Bank of Ireland. And uh, during the fiscal crisis of the early 80s, he was an economic advisor to the Irish uh, prime minister or Taoiseach, uh, Garrett Fitzgerald, uh, uh, at a time of uh, very uh, important salience of economic advisory work. In 1987, he joined the World Bank, then spent a number of years back in Dublin at the Economic and Social Research Institute, and uh, then back in the World Bank in uh, 1998. He has uh, done, uh, he has provided uh, considerable contributions to the World Bank's uh, work on uh, development economics and also uh, intervene in a number of countries, some of them under stress that is uh, not unlike, not exactly similar to, but not unlike what Ukraine is experiencing now. So it's also a privilege to have him today uh, to shed that comparative light on uh, the current situation. Patrick has also taught at LSE, at the uh, University of California, San Diego, at Australian National University, at University College Dublin, at Trinity College Dublin, uh, and of course, between September 2009 and uh, November 2015, he also was 
uh, the governor of the central bank of his country, the uh, central bank of Ireland, and known very much uh, at the time as, uh, I quote, a straight talker. So many common threads uh, between uh, the two uh, speakers today. I have to mention, of course, that Patrick, since 2016, has been a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, and we're also privileged to have him in the team. With that, uh, Valeria, over to you. Good morning, America. Uh, go good afternoon, Europe. And of course, all my best wishes to Kiev. If someone, my colleagues maybe, or some friends are, are looking right now for uh, our event. Mm, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, quite limited time. That's why let's start from very, very short presentation. Because you know that our event today is dedicated to wartime economy and financial system in Ukraine. That's why let's start from uh, my presentation. I Right now, I will show you some very short presentation and slides. And we will start. Uh, wartime, wartime economy and financial system in Ukraine. And so we start right now from very short excursion uh, from uh, very short excursion to our recent history, recent history. And you will understand after uh, why uh, I start to do that. First of all, uh, as you see, it's 2014. That time I became a governor of the central bank. It's a Kiev, 2014. And 2014, frankly speaking, war already started. First of all, in February 2014, it was annexion of Crimea, when we lost 3% uh, of our GDP and 2 million of our population. After, in uh, July and August, it was uh, 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 our territory in Eastern Donbass uh, were already occupied. And we lost 10% uh, of our territories, 15% of our GDP, and uh, three people uh, became in real internal refugees. That's why it was absolutely awful situation. As you see, we lost 20% of our GDP um, together because of annexion of Crimea and war in Donbass, balance of payment collapsed, completely collapsed, and plus unsustainable imbalances in all sectors of domestic economy and absolutely awful situation in the banking sector because of uh, previous 20 years. And you will see right now, it's very short, uh, we will uh, look for this slide very shortly without details. Later on, you could find all this presentation uh, in Peterson Institute website. Uh, that's why right now, uh, it was a real perfect storm. And it was macro crisis, currency crisis, and banking sector crisis. And after we go further, mm, like mission and Possible. Uh, but we completed all major reforms of the financial and banking sector in just in three years. We moved to flexible exchange rate regime and implemented a new monetary policy of inflation targeting. We cleaned up uh, the banking system from insolvent banks and enhanced its resilience. And we built a powerful modern and independent central bank. That's why I'd like to show you all of that uh, before we start the real discussion about times bigger, 10 times bigger wartime, because uh, even nine years ago, it was a real wartime in our country. But right now, it's absolute disaster. And uh, that's why after our reform, what we had before this war, the result was uh, Ukraine had a truly independent modern central bank, transparent and well-capitalized banking system that generates the highest profit in history of Ukraine, sound monetary policy that contributes to sustainable economic growth, and international recognition as a role model for a modern and transparent central bank. Central Bank of Ukraine even got the uh, top one uh, award about transparency in the world. That's why, you know, even our site, it's a transparency. And right now we see 24th of February 2022, the full-fledged bloody war with bombs, missiles, tanks, and military troops started. And we lost, nobody knows how much we lost. 
But uh, first estimation of World Bank, it's a 45%. Estimation of our prime minister, it's a 50% of our GDP. And our infrastructure is being completely destroyed. And 11, people, uh, 11 million refugees, including 4.5 people, uh, billion people abroad. You remember 20% uh, of our GDP in 2014 and 3 million of refugees. Right now, 11 million of refugees and 50% of our GDP. And infrastructure was completely destroyed in Donbass uh, in 2014. Right now, infrastructure ruined everywhere. Because missiles, you know, bombing daily right now, even today, right now, when we are talking with you, it's still there. That's why it, it's, of course, it's an absolute disaster what's going on right now. We will not, I'm not a military expert, that's why we will discuss today just economy, just banking sector, okay? And we are moving further. Thanks to the reforms, uh, Ukrainian banking system has been demonstrated and perfectly resilience in the wartime. I was even shocked uh, how, because all Ukrainian banks are working now. No bank run at all. Deposit and local currency are even growing right now. Banks are actively lending to agricultural sector for sowing season. Banks are physically opening their branches in the uh, liberated territories. And banks are liquid and help the economy to get on military footing right now. I'm absolutely happy to uh, tell you all of that today. Uh, how it's happened? Uh, why it's everything is uh, such a good uh, picture in the war time? Uh, believe me, if you are not prepared before, you will not get the same uh, picture uh, uh, right now. Uh, because uh, we prepare, because we went through wartime in 2014 and 2015, that's why a central bank was quite good prepared for all these challenges and disasters. And thanks to uh, a quick and effective National Bank of Ukraine actions, and frankly speaking, thanks to COVID remote working experience. It's funny, but COVID, uh, we used to work remotely during the COVID time, and it's very, very helped us during the war time. Our banking system has immediately switched to a wartime working mode. First of all, we need to understand that wartime economy, we need a new wartime working model for banking sector. And in 2015, based on our wartime experience, National Bank developed a detailed contingency plan. Frankly speaking, I was in driving seat to develop this contingency plan in 2015. And of course, uh, my colleagues right now updated all of that. They're absolute uh, genius and well done. I congratulate the National Bank staff for that. And uh, this contingency plan was especially to prevent panic and further snowball effect. And we activated this backup plan at the very first day of the war. They not uh, waste time to prepare contingency plan. They had contingency plan and they activated immediately in the first day of the war when martial law was announced in the country. First, firstly, National Bank fixed exchange rate uh, for all war time. Uh, that's why uh, fixed rate, it, it, it's, it's a really anchor right now. Secondly, National Bank introduced temporarily administrative measures to prevent massive withdrawal of deposit, quick depletion of the international reserves, as well as a free fall of the exchange rate. And um, uh, uh, the measure included some restrictions of capital and some current transaction and transfer uh, abroad. Thirdly, Central Bank provide banks with daily emergency liquidity uh, to support uh, liquidity of the uh, banking sector, uh, li liquidity, emergency liquidity support up to, one, uh, up to one year financing. And all of that helped to prevent financial, uh, preserve financial stability of banking system and allow the bank to work efficiently even during work time. And right now we are going to the most difficult part. Uh, you know that in 2022, Ukraine will have huge financial hole, just huge financial hole, and all of us need to fill it in. As the budget revenues have collapsed because of GDP contraction and absence of tax payments, it's the first problem. 
The uh, Ukraine uh, is running a monthly budget deficit of, of four billion dollars. It's an NBU projection, and uh, today Minister of Finance uh, announced that uh, uh, March, uh, April, it will be even five or seven, even seven billion. Uh, but uh, because I'm former central banker, I, I rely on uh, national bank projection four billion um, US dollars. So 22 budget deficit will be near 30% or even more. And more, 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 uh, moreover, Ukraine faced 90 billion US dollar debt redemption in this year. Export capacity destroyed completely. The main ports are occupied. It's a catastrophic losses, not only for today, it's for years ahead. And uh, total economic loss of today is estimated is $564 billion, including 270 billion of infrastructure. Even when I prepared my presentation one week ago, it was 150. You, you know, it's happened daily. That's why today it's 270 billion, uh, billion losses of infrastructure. Tomorrow it could be uh, uh, trillions. Nobody knows exactly when this war uh, uh, will be stopped and 49 billion uh, US dollar of budget revenues. Sorry, guys, it's a three times annual GDP of Ukraine. It's just the losses of this war as of today. And let's go further for the next slide. Uh, how we will finance that? How? Who could imagine something like that? How we will finance that? And uh, that's why it's, sorry, it's my uh, estimation, uh, but I truly believe that uh, it, it could be a reality. First of all, IFIs, International Financial Institution Commitments, right now it's 11.8 billion and uh, 3.2 already received last month. Uh, local QE, you know, it's a very powerful instrument of all central banks. And I will show that uh, in war 2014, 90% uh, of war financing was a local QE, but of course we will discuss the, the consequences of that. That's why 9QE right now announced uh, 400 billion grivna, uh, plus 40 billion grivna for agri-sector guarantees, 20 billion already received last month. USA commitment, it's a really gr great one. It's uh, $13.6 billion, including 6.6 .6 for humanitarian assistance and rest for military support. Well, uh, if you we will discuss further, uh, maybe in details, uh, what do you think about that? And uh, uh, it, it, it was my idea that just seven EU, EU need to provide about 10 billion US dollars to cover this gap, just to cover the budget deficit, to cover these gap and military expenses as well. And of course, maybe Minister will not agree but I think that public external debt restructuring is inevitable for short-term instruments. For long-term, of course, it's not necessarily to do if Ukraine, and not if, when Ukraine will exist, uh, we will pay all our debts. It's no doubts about that. It's an interesting slide. In 2014, as I mentioned to you, deficit was mostly covered by a local QE. In presentation, you will see uh, the uh, balance sheet of central bank and uh, and how we stop to do fiscal dominance. Uh, I could tell you that um, all our reforms you could read in my book, uh, Mission, Mission Possible. And uh, that's why for war economy, this book will be very, very useful um, for some central banks. Of course, uh, I, I wish it's never happened with any country in this world. And the next slide, uh, the first slide was about how to finance budget deficit. And, uh, but this slide, it's about new Marshall Plan for Ukraine, because uh, my uh, slide, uh, my first slide from 2014 proves that you could do reform in three years, but when all reforms are done, you could do a real recovery of Ukrainian economy and Ukrainian even cities in a five up to ten minimum five, of course, maximum 10 years. It will be even full recovery and even uh, absolutely good uh, macro financial situation in Ukraine. But how we will uh, finance these absolutely incredible figures? It's mentioned new Marshall Plan for Ukraine. 
And of course, uh, you see uh, central bank frozen assets, EU grants, and SDR relocation. We will discuss right now, and always all of that will lead to restoration of Ukraine. That's why uh, let's start from frozen assets. It's $300 billion uh, frozen assets of Russian central bank. And uh, we, we should use it for war reparation in Ukraine. But we need to start a legal process uh, like uh, Hague uh, Tribunal or Nuremberg process now. Because uh, it's never happened in the uh, recent history of our Earth. That's why uh, we need to do that now to use this money for reparation to Ukraine. The second source, it's a SDR a reallocation from Western countries. I think that we could use, it's more than $200 billion allocation was done and Western countries didn't use it. That's why I think that reallocation of $100 billion as per liquidity remains after the last COVID-driven CD allocation could be done right now. And EU grants in the amount of $100 billion, it looks like absolutely huge, incredible amount for EU, but let's recall that even small Czech Republic during the EU accession got $100 billion like grants from European Union. That's why, uh, because I truly believe that Ukraine will be a candidate for membership uh, in one month's time for Eurozone. I truly believe that EU could provide this grant, but of course it's better if you, EU will cover all these uh, grants by confiscation of frozen assets of Russian oligarchs in EU and G7. Because it's already frozen right now, I think that EU should not suffer themselves to provide all this financing, but cover all this financing, uh, needed financing by uh, confiscation of frozen assets of Russian oligarchs. And the last, maybe not the last, but uh, um, slide um, to the end of my presentation, it's roadmap of currency liberalization after the war. You know that uh, Ukraine introduced absolutely draconical administrative measures right now. But it will be not 100%, you know, even if war stop uh, tomorrow, you know, this uh, liberalization of and elimination of all these restrictions will not be one day exercise. According to my estimation, uh, after the war time, we will need three years for gradual withdrawal of temporary currency restrictions, which, not, uh, which will be not a time base, but conditional base. Liberalization will be linked to certain conditions, including macroeconomic stability, fiscal consolidation, accumulation of sufficient international reserves. And you see the stage zero, stage one, and stage three. It's uh, my experience from 2014 and 15. That's why I, I think I'm quite professional in that. That's why you could believe that we need liberalization. Uh, um, the special roadmap will be designed for three years. And my last slide is that. Uh, the war has seismic, uh, seismic global consequences for all of us, for all countries. And I truly believe that it's a real third world war. Even if uh, someone, uh, you know, in one book show us that world war should be just a nuclear one, no. It's a world, third world war. Uh, the, uh, you know, the hot part, it's in the territory of Ukraine, but all consequences and all of that will be everywhere around the globe. And all countries, which, you, you know, everybody will suffer. And some African countries will even be uh, on a uh, brink of precipice because it could be even starvation because of U Ukrainian uh, uh, agricultural sector disaster. That's why we need to stop uh, hypocrisy. Putin's war of aggression runs over the money which Russia right now gets from for fossil, uh, for selling fossil fuels to Europe. It's a $700 million per day. And of course, um, Russian men may collect uh, $321 billion uh, right now only from oil and gas, or total export revenues right now by uh, Russian revenues, 600 billion. And because of very high prices for gas and oil, uh, they will, this year, uh, the current account surplus will be highest, record highest of their history 
like 240 billion dollars. Severe sanctions and even default of Russian obligation will not crush Russian economy. Absolutely not. And even Joseph Borrell said recently that EU paid Russia 35 billion euro from beginning of the war when Ukraine got just 1 billion euro for weapons. Uh, it was maybe one year ago, I could, uh, one, uh, one week ago. Right now, I could say that they already paid 40 billion when they still paid 1 billion oh, to Ukraine. So we need to stop immediately all this war and all this hypocrisy. We need to understand that it's uh, really war of all civilized world against one crazy dictator. I finished my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Valeria, and uh, over to you, Patrick. I should have mentioned, uh, thanks for mentioning it, I should have mentioned your book of uh, 2020, um, whose uh, full title is Mission Possible, the true story of Ukraine's comprehensive banking reform and practical manual for other nations. And uh, clearly that says it all. Um, Patrick. Thank you. Yes, I mean, the current situation is, is so devastating in, in Ukraine that it's internal financial measures can really only have a limited role and it seems almost disrespectful to the people who are suffering people who are resisting to uh, focus on issues of, of domestic finance and, and still uh, this is um, let, let's let's proceed to, to, to an extent on, on this point I, I mean Valeria's achievement in in 2015 in stabilizing the financial system early 2015 after the devastating collapse in in the Rivna, um, in the previous stage of the war, 2014-15, it intensified at that point, and she stepped in, despite her clear understanding of the importance of markets, she said, no, we've got to block this market, we've got to introduce capital controls, draconian effective capital controls, not with lots of leak leakages to your friends, but effective capital controls, and they prevented further deterioration in the Hrivna, it, it protected the fearful people from the consequences of their own actions. If, if, if they'd been allowed to export, to, to, to have the capital flight, they, they would have collapsed even further. They would have suffered. The economy would have suffered. And that was blocked. And it was blocked in a way that, that allowed the, the sta stability to return. And it returned at a, at a rate of exchange, which gradually liber liberalization, the rate of exchange was more or less, actually was better than it had reached at the worst point of, the, of that collapse in, in early 2015. It went to 34 and hey, it's at 29 now. So, um, so this was an extraordinary stabilization and it was followed by the introduction of inflation targeting and a measured step-by-step -step reopening of, of capital markets. The question now is, can they pull it off a second time? Can you, Ukrainian authorities, National Bank, can they repeat this successful experience in, in financial management? Now, I'll come back to this internal finance issue this time, but we have to remember that this time the war is so extensive, so devastating, that uh, in terms of finance, the priority must be financing from abroad, not internal financing. Uh, and Valeria has made that obviously quite, quite clear. And there are two dimensions to it. The first dimension is keeping the economy and the government budget going. Um, and we heard those estimates, 4 billion a month, 5 billion, 7 billion. And remember the GDP of Ukraine before the war is, I don't know, 160, 170 billion US, something like that. And then secondly, later, when the war is over and the reconstruction begins, there's an even larger cost. To, to be born. And again, a lot of this will have to come from abroad. And, and Valeria has talked about the role of the IFI. The IMF is in there with its hurried 1.4 billion uh, rapid financing arrangement. Uh, Ukraine's already uh, quite indebted to, to the IMF and it benefited from the SDRs allocation last year. It's another two and a half billion SDRs. Um, other donors there, EU, EU US, um, not not clear that this is at all enough. And one thing I want to raise is the question of, of central bank swaps, which has been mentioned by several people, and it's been activated in the case of Poland. Uh, National Bank of Poland did provide a $1 billion um, dollar 
uh, swap line to the National Bank of Ukraine. I'm not sure exactly how and why this is being used. I mean, swaps, um, they, they come up as a potential solution to all sorts of problems because they seem sort of costless to everybody. And of course, they're not costless. Um, some, and very often they're used to stabilize the banking system um, in, in the face of, of some uncertainties. Um, in the past, years ago, they were, they were used to stabilize exchange rates. I think that this Polish one may have been used to assist uh, the, the cash pro provision of cash in foreign exchange to refugees to some extent. But the question is, could this be done on a more wide basis? I'm sure the the, the uh, provision from Poland of a billion was, was great, but um, and, and welcome. Uh, is the ECB a potential player in this? Is the EC if the ECB was a potential player, would it need to get instructions, guidance? Uh, say so from, from the, the uh, council, uh, from other European um, institutions. Uh, how could this be arranged? Should the ECB accept such a responsibility? Um, you know, if, if they did, they would have a very good, good incentive to then try to recover, in due course, to recover from the, the Russian the Russian reserves, which which are there, and, and um, I think there's a there's a great, lovely equivalence between, well, horrible equivalence really, between the estimated costs of of re reconstruction given by Valeria as, as 564 billion, and the current uh, figure for Bank of Russia's foreign exchange and gold reserves, which is just over 600 billion. Um, so th there's there's a, an equivalence. And the provision of short-term finance by donors, including central banks, that could uh, give you the rapid delivery of, of funds and then later collect it in the, in the, with, with, with legal actions, reparations, and so on and so forth. Um, but to come back to the internal finance question, uh, uh, an issue I would have and a question I would have for Valeria is, in 2015, the exchange rate had fallen uh, and then the exchange rate growth were brought in, but I, there was no peg at that stage. Um, maybe it was to some extent managed, but there was no peg. This time it's a peg, and it's part, um, as I understand, it's part of her contingency plan. How long is this peg going to be a good way of dealing with the situation? Um, you know, some critics will say, oh, this is a knee-jerk reaction. A Ukrainian authorities going back 10, 20 years, they're always pegging the exchange rate. Now they've pegged it again. It's back to the bad old days. Uh, um, it's not a risk that a pegged exchange rate could become highly uncompetitive and, and be an obstacle, obstacle to, to, um, to, to restructuring and the recovery of the economy. Um, and the final point, because I don't want to take up uh, time, um, in this current situation, and, and as the recovery start, you know, at the end of the war, the recovery starts to build up, I think there probably would be a lot of reliance on the banking system as a delivery mechanism for uh, the funds that are, are available through the budget, from abroad, and so on. And, and yet the banking system, though it's much better than it was, it's still a very low depth banking system. Um, it's credits of the private sector is only 20% of GDP. It has uh, high spreads on, on those loans, high dollarization. Um, I, I wonder, is it is it a strong enough vehicle to carry what many will expect to be a, 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 its task in maintaining activity during the, the war and helping to um, finance the restructuring post-war. I'd be very interested to hear Valeria's views on, on that. Um, I'm going to stop there because I, I, if, I, if I go on, I would only talk about Russia and financial sanctions and what more could be done, and that's a different topic. We will come to uh, sanctions on Russia later in this session, but I think uh, we really want to focus on the Ukrainian situation and indeed uh, two great questions from Patrick on the sustainability of the peg and on the depths of the banking sector. So uh, back to you, Valeria. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, good questions to the point. Absolutely. First of all, uh, let's discuss uh, some uh, possible swaps lines. Uh, I was the first uh, central banker in Ukraine who uh, concluded the first swap deal with China. It was for 2.6 billion in remembers. Uh, 
the, the equivalent uh, US dollar equivalent was 2.6. After it was a Swedish bank, they provided us half a billion. And after it was a Marek Belka from Bank of Poland, uh, he provided us one billion. So that's why right now uh, the central bank again reactivated this one billion. So that's why I think uh, they could even try to reactivate uh, Chinese uh, swap as well. Mm, uh, because it's also quite sizable. But all of that, it's not absolutely enough. Uh, and I do not want to, uh, you know, put all these uh, problems to the shoulders of uh, central banks of each particular country. It's better, of course, to do a big swap line uh, with uh, European Central Bank. And we discuss with you that if Ukraine became a member uh, of European Union, and right now we will become a candidate, means that you could uh, together accelerate their efforts and together with grants provide uh, swap lines with European Central Bank. I think it's a better solution than bilateral uh, swap lines with all banks. It's my opinion. And about uh, peg exchange rate, it's uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we uh, switched to free float in 2015 and we were so, so happy of that. You could not be in a free float in the wartime. It's a rule. Uh, this rule was even learned by David Lipton because uh, at that time when IMF uh, using their uh, Bible books of IMF using uh, that liberalization of market should be all the time, I was the first opponent and it was a really strong discussion with David Lipton and finally he recognized that wartime is absolutely not a normal business as usual mode. You need immediately to switch. Even my recommendation in Financial Times for Nabiulina was uh, to put her resignation letter after the war when she fixed the rate and introduced draconical administrative measures. It was my recommendation to her to be respected banker to, to do all of that and after to put her resignation letter and not to finance Putin's aggression. Otherwise, she will be sitting in a, a Nuremberg uh, tribunal process among all these uh, crime uh, bandits. You know, I think she was really respected banker uh, in 2015, maybe she, when she got the uh, award of best banker, central banking. Uh, of the year. And uh, th 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 that's why I think about PEC. We need right now, nobody knows uh, supply, demand, markets, how you could understand that, all of that during the war time. We're absolutely right that central bank fix the rate. What will be later on? Uh, what kind of rate we will get? If we will continue to, in one day without a liberalization roadmap, we will free market in one day? Of course, maybe it could be devaluation huge devaluation because we will lost 50% of our GDP. But I explain in my presentations and we need three years for liberalization. It will be roadmap step by step. And if we do that, all this international Marshall Plan support, what it will be, it will be huge inflow of currency. Central bank will just sit in and buy currency daily to their reserves. And after that, in three years time, when your reserve will be even higher than today's reserves, what kind and when your business will already be in real life, you know, and when your GDP from right. services will be immediately switched, you will get very good picture uh, with Ukrainian currency, yes, because of its reflection of your balance of payment. It's a mirror of your balance of payment, your, uh, your exchange rate in your country. That's why uh, we need to survive, we need to stop a war, and after step by step, we need all this financing and a liberalization of market. That's why it's an absolutely good solution. I'm happy that we uh, experience all these problems with uh, some smaller magnitude of war in 2000. 15, and in to, right now in 2022, we were ready for all this introduction immediately. That's why I think it's absolutely good solution. And about banking system. A banking system, uh, it's a really, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's a very well capital, uh, was very well capitalized, was absolutely liquid. It's even liquid right now and work uh, like a, a switch um, watches, you know, absolutely good. I was even surprised to see that. And I'm very proud to see that. 
And, uh, but of course, let's think about recapitalization of banking sector. Because you could imagine how you should reflect all these losses. You, you, because it's losses of businesses, losses of activities, losses of uh, all, all, all collaterals. Uh, it's huge losses. But again, uh, in my book, you could read even what we did in 2015. Uh, because when we did our first stress test and asset quality review, all Ukrainian banking system was insolvent. All Ukrainian banking system was in collapse. I could tell you this way. And first time again with IMF, when I start to discuss recapitalization plan of Ukrainian banking system, IMF was shocked. They said, what you like, what you proposed us? You proposed us to keep some banks afloat without the sufficiency of their capital. But if we will be back, I announced in 2015 after asset quality review and stress test that Ukraine will need five years for recapitalization. And in the first, uh, after the first year, in one year time, we need to achieve zero capital adequacy ratio. What does it mean? It means that all banks are bankrupt. Ben, uh, and right now, and after it was a five year for recapitalization, I think for this war, uh, I think that the central bank will uh, give about uh, one or two years for banks to understand what's going on with uh, their balance sheet. After that, uh, they will do asset quality review together with banks. And after that, they will announce the recapitalization plan. And because all our banks transparent with very good procedures, with good transparent shareholders, and I think it's not a big problem that we will maybe for next recapitalization plan after this war, we will need five years or maybe even wow. 10. It's main idea for central bank right now to keep liquidity of banking sector and transparency, of course. Right. Um... Patrick, in your question, I uh, maybe I misunderstood, but I heard uh, a hint that maybe um, a desirable uh, alternative uh, distribution system for credit to to get credit into the economy and uh, and and have it uh, on the ground uh, where it's needed. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on what you had in mind? Because I, I what I heard was not just a so it's a question of future solvency, but also the current uh, current uh, operation. You're muted now. You're Sorry, muted. something has happened. Um, yeah. Something has happened. I'm hearing. getting interference. Um, please, please, Russian. can you hear what I'm hearing? No. We hear you well. Oh, you hear me well. All right. I, there's terrible interference here. Um, I'm not trying to imply some uh, alternative um, public delivery system for, for support. I'm just thinking that there might be s some strengthening of the um, of the banking system, because what we see is that they are not really uh, as embedded throughout the economy as you would like to see. So I I just see a gap there, and a gap that might um, need to be strengthened in some way that I don't have a have a solution for. But if we if we assume that uh, there, every bank in Ukraine ha has fingers into every uh, household and industry that needs financial support, that is probably not the case, given the, the shallow right. uh, nature of the of banking system. Can you tell us a bit more, Patrick, also on the ECB swap lines? I mean, you've been in the governing council of the ECB. Um, if you had the proverbial magic wand, what would you do at this point? Well, uh, I think that one has to be quite um, explicit and honest about, about what one is doing with the swap line. Generally speaking, a swap line is something very short term. It's, uh, it's a, an arrangement between central banks where each trusts the other uh, and their ability to, to repay. And the reason for a swap line usually is because the borrowing central bank needs to provide foreign exchange to its banking system uh, and only it has a an adequate assessment of the solvency of those of those uh, banks. So that's the normal way of doing it. But you can use swaps in different circumstances. And it seems to me that if you're in the situation as in, in, in Europe, where it takes quite a long time to get a general agreement and mechanisms together to provide large sums of finance, if there's a political willingness 
uh, on the part of, of uh, European uh, governments and uh, leaders to provide financial assistance to Ukraine, that can be provided very quickly and promptly by the central banks, as long as the central bank, the ECB, is, is, uh, is indemnified against such an action. So in, in a sense, it would be an, a different, a new type of, of, um, of uh, use of a swap arrangement. I'm not sure that it's an ideal or necessary tool, but it's something that should definitely be considered because I think the, the idea the swap is the ability to deliver funds quickly and um, efficiently. But then so, where you have to fill in the, 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 the credit dimension, the solvency dimension. So we have a, a, a bunch of... Um... Well, I have a bunch of questions. There's one question in the q and I'll come to it immediately. Uh, I see that uh, among the participants, uh, Sebnem Tahin uh, is uh, raising her hand, but I would ask her if she can also ask uh, a question through the Q&A, which will make it uh, easier to manage since we have, unfortunately, only 15 minutes left. Uh, but, uh, but Julia Kirali uh, is asking, uh, is saying hello, uh, Valeria, but uh, also asking, well, she's asking whether you will come back to Ukraine to help the country. I don't know if you want to answer that one. Uh, but uh, she's also asking about hyperinflation and, uh, and how, what you see as uh, the prospects for uh, inflation in the country. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, Sergei Guriev was here and he mentioned uh, the number of 2% uh, inflation a week in Russia. Can you give us a sense of uh, what's the situation on the ground right now in Ukraine and more, perhaps more importantly, how you see it going forward? Valeria. Uh, first of all, of course, I'd like to, uh, to be back to my, <laughs> my country, my mother's country, to Ukraine. And hope and one day it will it definitely will be there. And uh, what, what, what um, about inflation? Uh, you know, um, uh, right now it's in Ukraine it's thirteen point seven. It's very very high, of course. It's but you know during the war time, it's very difficult to say uh, inflation. Uh, you know, it's uh, right now uh, inflation in Ukraine. It's not because of all international. Problems even in America right now, inflation is 8.5. Uh, you know, in the UK, high, highest ever inflation, and uh, it's a supply and demand is good, but supply is destroyed. That's why it's a pure uh, problem of supply right now in Ukraine, unfortunately. And uh, how we could improve uh, uh, all of that, you know. Right now, central bank introduced such a draconical measures that uh, import, uh, imports could be only some critical imports. Uh, and that's why we could not uh, blame some other imports. But in the same time, su supply problem, if people require some, for, for example, medicine or something, and you cannot find it, you could immediately, it will be reflection uh, or, or in prices. That's why, unfortunately, I could not uh, right now reassure everybody that central bank could do something to stop this inflation. If in other countries right now, it could be easily done, not so easily maybe in Germany, if they will introduce embargo for oil and gas, but they need to sacrifice a few percent of their GDP to stop this bloody war. And, and again, because you remember what's happened in Germany when they stop all their nuclear energy production and switch to uh, Russian gas. Maybe in uh, ten, we will recognize maybe in one day that uh, their green parties were financed by Putin or I don't know, I could not explain why they did all of that and right, right now 100% dependent on Russian supply of oil and gas. But in other countries, they could do that. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, you, you see about Federal Reserve, you see about Bank of England, they are very reluctant to do that uh, efficiently, how to say. But unfortunately, in Ukraine, Central Bank, it's absolutely, it's ready. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that Central Bank uh, re is ready to do all necessary steps. But unfortunately, in wartime, it doesn't work. They could not do that. Hmm. Um, Patrick, do you want to comment on the inflation dynamics? Well, of course, there's the very strange inflation development all around the world. But I think on, on top of that in Ukraine, it, it, facing a, a, a period of monetary financing, um, particularly if, there, if foreign funding doesn't come, um, there might be a, a considerable additional inflationary uh, impulse in Ukraine. And I think this is something that, that one, one would uh, really need to, to worry about. Ukraine has a 
a sort of checkered history of, of rapid inflation. Um, uh, obviously, going in 1995, the hyperinflation, but then a, a, number, a couple of additional waves, um, in, including the one in, in 2014-15, which is 50% in a year. I'm afraid that that, that that is a risk if you rely too much on monetary financing. Yeah, may, 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 may I also mention uh, uh, our experience of fiscal dominance? And I, sh I showed you uh, how we financed war, war of 2014-2015 because nobody provided us any support for military expenditure. No one in this world at that time we, uh, used our local QE for that. And consequences was absolutely inevitable, you know, inflation 45% and three times devaluation. Of course, inflation was through, passed through effect from devaluation. Right now, it's not the case. We get international financing and foreign currency right now, you know, and we, we fixed the rates. That's why inflation right now in Ukraine is just a, a real disruption of supply. I'd like to go to sovereign solvency. Um next uh you mentioned your discussion with the uh, ukrainian minister uh, or ministry of finance about that um i given the intensity of the effort that is uh required of ukraine at this point is it really necessary to reimburse all the creditors how do you see the trade-offs uh of uh you know repaying the, the debt uh, including as you mentioned short-term debt uh, and um, and what's the best way to think about that? This is something that our colleague at the Institute, Anna Gelpern, has also contributed a lot to. Uh, there's a lot of debate, uh, both vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, on the pros and cons of, um, of honoring the, the sovereign debt obligations. Can you give us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I didn't discuss with Minister of Finance. It's his public speeches uh, today uh, about that we will continue to pay our debt. In 2014, we started, it was a former Minister of Finance, uh, Natalia Yareska, and she was in the driving seat of debt restructuring. And But it was without debt restructuring that time, Central Bank could not guarantee any macro financial stability. That's why thanks to uh, Natalia Yareska, Minister of Finance, at uh, the time of Ukraine, uh, she supported uh, uh, all balance of payment of Ukraine and central bank could guarantee macrofinancial stability. That's why for me, no doubt that short-term short debt should be restructured. Otherwise, you know, all our supporters from international financial organization, US budget, all other uh, uh, EU budget uh, should finance uh, Ukraine to repayment of Ukrainian debt. Why? they should do that. It's better for all investors in the world to understand that uh, reprofiling. I could not even tell you that it will be 100% restructuring like it was in 2015, when uh, you know it was some uh, deduction of face value of instrument and after a special new uh, uh, instrument was introduced to some Ukrainian um, uh, instruments. I, I do not think we need that. I need to, we think absolutely very easy exercise. Short term that should be in reprofiling. Me means just some maturity uh, should be extended for some period of time. And I think it's better for all, for investors and for Ukraine and for IMF as well. That's why a win-win situation for all of us. Definitely, de absolutely different story with Russia. Uh, you know, I am not 100% agree that Russian default will somehow help us. I think that uh, uh, embargo for oil and gas could help us, but it could hurt uh, diff uh, difficult it really could hurt some uh, European economies. That's why I propose a very easy scheme. It's a barter. It's a barter. Uh, we co open uh, some um, uh, escrow account. All this money for oil and gas should put uh, for this account. And repayment of uh, all investors should be done from this account. Okay, no default, but real good for investors and real good not to finance uh, you know, military expenditure for Putin. Patrick? Yeah, I, I think I, I think Valeria is absolutely right that it's short-term debt. This this should be paused in some way, um, a, a life ro ro rolling over in, or in, in some way. Um, but that's not going to be the end of the story. Uh, at, at the end of the story, when the, the war is over and financial settlements must be made, I, I consider it would very highly likely that there would be uh, deep, would have to be 
significant steep discounts on, on the pre-existing private debt. I mean, obviously, this is not unpayable without substantial injections of funds from, from abroad. And so it's part of the decision of the providers of funds from abroad. Uh, are they going simply to pay for other uh, private creditors or are they going to pay for the re re reconstruction of Ukraine? So this is a, the major issue here, uh, stating the obvious is the external assistance that Ukraine is getting now, should get in the near future, and will get also in the more distant future for restructuring and reconstruction. Uh, the other major issue, leaving aside, of course, the uh, military operations themselves, which are paramount, uh, is the uh, is, uh, uh, relation with Russia, the oil and, gas, uh, oil and gas ban discussions that you alluded to uh, several times. Uh, my question here is, is there more we should think about? So, for example, the European Union has only sanctioned some of Russia's banks should they, uh, you know, ramp up those sanctions on the Russian banking system. Are there other actions that haven't been taken or haven't been sufficiently discussed in terms of the um, uh, relationship with Russia that, from your perspective, should be uh, discussed more actively? Valeria. First of all, and from the first day of the war, I call to withdraw Russia from all international organizations. Russia, Russian aggressor could not be part of civilized humanity. It's, it's ridiculous to be a member of, uh, 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 you know, of United Union, member of World Bank, of IMF, they should be immediately withdrawn like country terrorist and country aggressor. And I'm absolutely sure that we need to reconsider all this uh, international, not only financial, but all international organizations right now. It's a unique chance for all of us to do that. That's why immediately uh, withdraw uh, Russia from all organization and of course uh, embargo. And if we could not introduce embargo, for example, for gas, because for oil we could somehow, we could regulate the price, but for gas, it's a physical delivery of gas. It's a different story. I propose to introduce all this scheme like uh, energy versus critical import of medicine, repayment for, of international investors not just upload that russia in default russia in default means more money in their account for to finance war absolutely yeah absolutely i i, I remind that um the bank for international settlements whose record around just before the second world war was not stellar in in uh, in respecting um in, in, in dealing with aggressive countries at this time, it actually has said no. Russia is suspended; is out of out of the story for uh, for the duration of the, of the war. So at least uh, one important institution in the financial sphere uh, has done that. As far as other financial sanctions are concerned, like like sanctioning additional banks, uh, I'm in, inclined to be dubious about measures that would have very limited effect. I, I think you know, let's let's find another five banks and sanction and tell them they're, they're not part of it. I, I think this step-by-step -step approach and um, the steps have been too small. You know, the freezing of the central bank's assets was big, but it wasn't yeah, enough to stop great. anything. It was great. It was really like an atomic bomb. And, and, it, and it had a, it had a huge gestural uh, measure, though it didn't, as, as any sense, it didn't stop them having the resources to fight the war. Um, they didn't need those reserves, and if they get them back, uh, then nothing will have happened. But... Uh, uh, but but uh, small steps, I think, uh, just discredit the whole idea of sanctions. So, uh, Valeria, uh, you mentioned the fact that the National Bank of Ukraine was uh, still in shape. Um, can you give us a sense of uh, what is what does it look like a central bank in wartime? Uh, have uh, some of the staff left uh, to go to the front, to emigrate? I mean, uh, 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 how is it possible to continue to do routine operations like, you know, statistics or utility functions uh, in uh, in those circumstances? Maybe as a last question, uh, very quickly, if you could give a sense, give us a sense of that. Uh, 
Uh, I think everybody in place, uh, it's not uh, really, I, mean, I know that management and some key employees, uh, maybe they uh, went to some uh, western part of Ukraine, but they still there in Ukraine and they work. But I was surprised when some employees of Ukrainian banks were sitting in the real shelters and, and, start, and continue to work. And I said that in my presentation, the thanks to COVID, Time, because in COVID time, all of us right now are sitting in the different places, but all of us working and all of us together right now, right here. That's quite extraordinary indeed, and uh, and the example uh, of resilience uh, that is provided to us by not just the central bank but so many stakeholders in Ukraine. And uh, thanks to Elon Musk, you know, they provided Ukraine Starlinks uh, because, even, for example, right now we have a, not a problem even with remote work. When we have some real connection, real uh, telephone and internet connection. And uh, uh, Elon Musk was quite advanced, you know, he already designed all the Starlinks and provided Ukraine with Starlinks as well. Thanks to Elon. Um, this is uh, both, um, of course, sobering and inspiring. Uh, we hope that we will have uh, section, uh, sessions of the series um, in a post-war environment when Ukraine is being reconstructed with the support of the EU and the international community. Uh, Patrick, maybe a last word from you and then we'll conclude. No, I, I'm, it's so depressing to see this is more dragging on into, into six, seven, eight weeks. Uh, I, I already thought it would be over after three or four weeks in a favorable direction to Ukraine. And um, the worst po possibility, possible situation is that it stagnates for a year or, or more. This would be even uh, worse than the situation that we've faced in the last few weeks. Uh, finance can help, but it can't solve that problem. Sobering indeed. Um, our thoughts are with the Ukrainian people. Uh, we. Hope, like you just suggested, Patrick, that this tragedy can come to an end soon. Uh, sadly, uh, many scenarios are possible at this point. Uh, our next session will be on a very different topic, sustainability standards, um, on uh, April 28th. Uh, so on a Thursday, uh, I will host you, Lloyd, the Vice Chair of the New International Sustainability Standards Board. But uh, to conclude this session, uh, I want to give many, many thanks uh, to Patrick, of course, but especially to Valeria Gontareva, a very um, important, inspiring um, and sobering uh, contribution. Thanks so much for having been with us today. Thank you. Bye. And have a good rest of your day. Bye.